Mr. Deputy Chairman, sir. I wish I was speaking on the budget in happier circumstances. Please, beach maintain. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. We were not protesting. We are pointing out. We are not saying anything. We are not saying anything only. No, no, not no, 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 I'm unhappy, in fact, I'm very unhappy that democracy is suffering a blow every day. What we have seen in Karnataka, what we are seeing in Goa, may appear to be political upmanship, but I think it has a very damaging effect on the economy. foreign investors, rating agencies, international organizations do not read Indian newspapers and do not watch the tamed Indian television channels. What they hear, what they read about political instability and political chicanery and political upmanship will have an impact on the economy. I only wish that the ruling party takes note of this. If they think they are advancing their political goals, I think at the same time they are doing a great disservice to the economic goals of this country. I sincerely appeal to them to respect democracy. What has happened in the last two days has gravely damaged democracy and more such incidents will completely damage the democratic framework of this country. I condemn what has happened in Karnataka. I condemn what has happened in Goa, not because it's a political event alone, but because it, because it, has, because it has a very damaging impact on the economy. Sir, I wish to compliment the finance minister Patangal Alvadum, Satangal Sevadum, Padinil Pengal Nadatavando, Yet to Marivinil, Anna King A pen, Ulaipilla Yentry, Kumi Hedi. This is Bardia. Bardia spoke about gender equality at the turn of the 20th century, in the early 20th century. And I'm very happy that, uh, that she has had the distinguished privilege of being the first woman finance minister of India. And I may also, also add, I'm doubly happy that she is from Tamil, from India. Yes. Having said that, please, having said that, I want to ask her, ask the finance minister, what is her macroeconomic view of the economy? Usually, one gleans it from reading the budget speech. There is a statement on the government's macroeconomic view of the world economy, and there is a statement on the government's macroeconomic view and the outlook for the Indian economy. Unfortunately, that is absent in the budget speech. In fact, it is the first budget speech which does not give in the speech the numbers of total revenue, total expenditure, the fiscal deficit, the revenue deficit, the additional resource mobilization, what we call ARM, or the tax concessions which have been given away to sections of the people. I can't recall a budget speech 
And I'm sure the finance ministry's officers cannot dig up another budget speech which is so bereft of macroeconomic data. You can always say, well, it is there in the annexure, it is there in the budget documents. But the budget documents are not accessible to the millions of people of this country. People who are listening and watching the finance minister on television, listening to her on radio, deserve to know what are these broad numbers, deserve to know what is being allocated for defense, deserve to know what is being allocated for women, scheduled caste, minorities, for health, for Magan Vega, for the midday meal scheme. Whatever be, I would humbly request the finance minister to eschew this practice in future and make a speech that is self-explanatory and self-contained so we have an idea of what the government's view on the macro economy is. When we come to the GDP, we are perplexed. It's true that the finance minister appeared to give a very weak explanation yesterday in the other house. Let me give you my take on that. The GDP number for 2019-20 is the same, both in the budget documents and in the economic survey. But the calculation of GDP for the year that went by is very different. According to the budget documents, it's 18 lakhs 84,000. I'm sorry, 1 crore 88 lakhs 40,000. According to the controller of government accounts, it's 1 crore 90 lakhs 29,000. You can always explain it away by saying, whatever be the GDP for the year that went by, we are agreed on the GDP for the new year, 2019-20. That's not the issue. The issue is, what is your growth projection? According to the budget documents, the growth projection is 8%. But if you take the CGS numbers, the growth projection is only 7%. It makes a big difference. 7% and 8% are simply not different only by 1%. 7% and 8% make a huge difference. And I'm perplexed that the government, that is the chief economic advisor, the controller of government accounts, and the finance minister, cannot present a unified picture of what will be the growth rate in 2019-20. If the government does not know, or the government speaks in different voices on the growth rate, what are the people to conclude? Be that as it may, sir, whatever be the growth rate, and I'll come to it a little later, 7% or 8%, how do you plan to sustain this growth rate or increase the growth rate? We have repeatedly said, and the finance minister says it in paragraph 9 and paragraph 24 of our budget speech, that we need to do structural reforms. Now, this is a very interesting phrase. Everybody says structural reforms. But what are structural reforms? Every reform is not a structural reform. In fact, every change is not a reform. Every minor change at the margins is not reform. You have to do structural reforms. The speech recognizes it in two places. But I ask myself, show me one structural reform in the entire budget speech. There is not one. And if you ask me what are structural reforms, I wrote a column once saying, in all the last 20 or 25 years, I think we've had only 11 major structural reforms. Dr. Saab is not here, but the bulk of them are attributable to Dr. Manmohan Singh. Those are structural reforms. When we took the red book for import and export and made a bonfire of it, that is structural reform. When we abolished licensing, 
that is structural reform. When we said FERA will go, exchange control will go, and the rupee will find its market rate, that was structural reform. Equivalent to that, where is a structural reform? It's not enough to say structural reforms, you must do structural reforms. And structural reforms requires disruption. You'll have to disrupt the status quo and do bold structural reforms. That alone will accelerate our development. And I'll, when I come to numbers a little later, I'll tell you the difference between doing structural reforms and not doing structural reforms. I'm afraid, sir, in this budget speech, there are no structural reforms. In the budget documents, there is no indication of any structural reform. And I'm afraid the result will be that the economy will be a status quoist economy, ambling along at the space of about 6.5% or 6.8%, which is not good for this country and certainly not good for those who are at the bottom of the pyramid, the bottom 20%. So, the crucial question is, the economic survey says this, the finance minister says this, that investment is the key to growth. There are four engines of growth, public expenditure, domestic consumption, exports, the only engine which was firing was domestic consumption. Unfortunately, even that engine seems to be sputtering now. The economic advisor says investment is the key and exports are the key. I'll come to exports a little later. Investment is the key. Investment needs money. You can either have resources raised domestically or you can get FDI. Now let's take resources raised domestically. What are the resources that you plan to raise domestically? The gross fixed capital formation was stagnant for three years at 28.5. In 2018 19, if you do the calculation, you will find the GFCF improved to 29.5. At one point of time, it was 34.5. It fell 6%, now fallen 5%. So what have you in the budget to say that domestic savings will increase, which will give an impetus to investment? If domestic savings are going to remain at 29.5%, where is the additional money going to, be to spur investment? I'm afraid there's nothing in this budget that will improve domestic savings. In particular, nothing in this budget that will improve household savings. Who saves? Is the middle class which saves? And what have you done to the middle class? Is there anything in this budget that will enthuse the middle class to save more? You have taxed long-term capital gains. You have now taxed buyback of shares. About the super-rich, which is a separate issue, you've increased their tax rate, but given no further relief to the middle class than what the interim budget gave. So where is the incentive for middle class to save more? And if household savings don't improve, domestic savings will not rise. If domestic savings do not rise, domestic investment will not rise. If domestic investment does not rise, the gross fixed capital formation will remain at about 29.5 or 30. If it remains at 29.5 or 30, how will you get 8% growth? Please teach me. I'm willing to be a student if the finance minister will be a teacher. I believe there was some debate about teacher and student in the other house. I'm willing to be a student. Let the finance minister be a teacher and tell me how will growth rise if domestic investment and GSD, GFCF remains at about 30. 
Now let's come to FDI. The budget speech says that FDI was 64.37 billion US dollars. She's right, but she forgot to mention it is gross FDI. Gross FDI was 64.375 billion last year. Net FDI was only 44 billion. So we should be absolutely transparent. She should have mentioned either both figures or she should have added the word, word gross to describe the FDI. Now, FDI has obvious limits. FDI is not in her control, not in anyone's control. FDI is controlled by the macro economy of the world. If US interest rates rise, if oil prices rise, if consumption rises in China, a variety of factors over which nobody has got control. So you can't rely only on FDI. The best way to boost investment rate is to boost domestic investment. And the best way to boost domestic investment is to boost domestic savings. The best way to boost domestic savings is to boost household savings. There is nothing, I repeat, there is nothing in this budget that will increase household savings. So, let me come to revenues. I've always held that this government loves to tax and spend. The last time that policy became a cropper. Unfortunately, as against budget estimates for 2018-19, the revenue loss was a lakh and 60,000 crore. The revenues just simply did not come. One of the reasons is growth faltered. There are many other reasons. I don't have the time, my colleagues will. Now let's look at the budget estimates under the six major taxes. Corporation tax, income tax, customs, excise, service tax, GST. The estimate was, for the year that went by, 22,42,833 crore. What did you actually collect? 19,67,187. When you work out net to center, you will find that as against an estimate of 14,84,406, which was there in the interim budget revised estimates presented in February, you actually collected, according to the controller of the government accounts, only 13,16,951. You lost a lakh and 60,000 crore. And now again, despite that experience, what are you projecting? Last year, income tax collections increased by 7.1%. For the new year, the finance minister is projecting income tax collection will rise by 23.25%. If you achieve that, you will rank with the Olympian pole vaulter. From 7.1%, you will rise to 23.25%. Customs was negative by 8.6%. Projection is plus 32%. Excise was flat, negative by half a percent. Projection is 15.55%. And now we come to the great GST. GST last year increased by 3.38%. Projection is 45%. And if you achieve these targets, I'll compliment you at the end of the year. But I'm afraid these targets are completely unrealistic. I wish you well. I wish your CBDT and the CBIC well. But I'm afraid these are completely unrealistic projections, unrealistic targets. And then I ask my question, if last year you lost 1,60,000, and this year you will lose another 1,60,000 crore or 2 lakh crore, how will you achieve your expenditure goals? How will you allocate monies for all that you have said? Please take a look at these numbers. Sir, so, 
I don't blame entirely the finance minister. She assumed office only about 50 days ago. And if she had reflected on the macroeconomy, I'm sure she would have done that, but not spelt it out in the budget speech. She would have realized, and I mean no disrespect to anyone, the economy that she inherited was a wobbly economy. She didn't inherit it from me. She inherited from her own government. So you no longer can blame this as a legacy issue. After five years of NDA, one, in the last year, 2018-19, growth was 8.0, 7.0, 6.6, 5.8. In the last year, the economy was in a decline. Point one to note. Farm sector grew at 2.9% only, the lowest in those five years. If you look at the farm sector graph, it's a decline. Over 10,000 farmers commit suicide every year. And the state that I have the honor to represent, Maharashtra, had 800 suicides this year alone until the 16th of June. IIP for manufacturing in four years, the last four years of the NDA government, was barely 2.8, 4.4, 4.6, 3.5. Nowhere near the double-digit growth that is required. And exports, and I said I'll come back to it. The finance minister was commerce minister for a while. The highest level was 315 billion US dollars in March 2014 when we left office. After that, for four years, exports did not cross $315 billion. Only in 2018-19, it barely crossed $315 billion U.S. dollars, merchandise export. As I said, there was a revenue loss of 1.6 lakh crore. Unemployment, according to the CMIE, is 7.8%. The workforce shrunk. The workforce shrunk by 4.7 crore people. Capital expenditure was only 1.7% of GDP. And what she has projected for the new year is only 1.6% of GDP. The gravity of unemployment can be looked at by only one example. For 62,907 Kalasi posts, 82 lakh people applied, out of which 4 lakh 19,137 were B.Tech graduates and 40,751 had a master's in engineering. This is the economy that she inherited. I don't blame her for that. But taking note of the reality, you should have been bold. The government has a superb mandate. 303 people in the Lok Sabha. <laughs> Dr. Manmohan Singh and I have exchanged notes. I, we wish we had a mandate of that kind at some time in our lives. <laughs> we didn't have a mandate. He worked with 145 people and then 206 people. You have a mandate of 303. And with your allies, you have a mandate of over 300. Uh, 52. Why, having inherited this situation, why did he not take bold measures? This is my grievance. Sir, I intend to leave, uh, I intend to take only 30 minutes. I intend to leave. You can take a little more. No, no, no. no. I intend to leave about 100 minutes for my colleagues. I'm sure they will deal with uh, allocations, etc., etc. Let me, Take this is not intended to provoke you, it is intended to underscore the reality. Let's do some fact checks. The fact check is a favorite pastime today for media. I want to do some fact checks. First one, 50 crore Indians have got health insurance. Is that correct? Under your scheme, only 30 lakh people, 30 lakh people 
have got the benefit after hospitalization. Then you say 40 crore people will get pensions. Is that correct? No. The first pension payout will come in the year 2039. You will have to contribute and you will get your pension at 60 years. The first pension payout will come in 2039. We are only in 2019. 99% of all villages are covered by sanitation, 5.6 lakh villages are ODF. Ask Mr. Bezwada Wilson, he'll tell you what it means. It means that the kind of toilets we are building today without double pit <coughs> soak pits perpetuates the septic tank, perpetuates manual scavenging. Please address that first. 144 people have died as a result of cleaning septic tanks in Tamil Nadu since 1993. Over 800 people have died in India. 88 people have died this year. A study by government revealed 23% own but don't use the toilet. <coughs> a study by a private agency revealed 43% of toilets are not used or not usable because there's no water. Come to Nandurbar district of Maharashtra. Come to Nandurbar district of Maharashtra. And the Indian Express field report said entire district, village after village said we don't use the toilet. We are the most water scarce district in the whole country. How can we use water for cleaning our toilets? We don't get water for drinking. We don't get water for bathing. We don't get water for cooking. We have great difficulty in getting water. How will we use water in our toilets? Next fact check. I've already said this. FDI, you said, was 64.375 billion. Minor correction, it is gross FDI, not net FDI. Next fact check. You say, Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana, for which I salute Mr. Bajpai. He introduced this program. I acknowledged it even when I was finance minister. 97% of the villages are covered. Now come to my district. My district collector, Shivaganga, tells me, all villages are covered, sir, in our district. Therefore, I don't get any more PMGSY money. I said, what do you mean? The roads that you built 10 years ago are no longer motorable. And you call it an all-weather road. Just because you build a road 10 years ago or 12 years ago, doesn't mean it is an all-weather road forever and ever. What is it? Is it made of steel and gold? So don't make this claim that 97% of villages are covered. Come to my constituency, I'll show you village after village where the road was motorable when I got PMGSY funds to invest there, but it's no longer motorable. And finally you say in your speech that NPAs have been reduced by 1 lakh crore. Absolutely correct. But you should have also said in the five years of Modi 1, 5 lakh 55,603 crore rupees was written off for corporates. Mm. So you reduce repeat, NPAs repeat, of 1 lakh crore, but you write, write off 5,55,603 crore only for corporates. Mm. You won't write off farm loans. You won't write off education loans. You won't write off loans for the micro or small industry, but you will write off 5,55,000 crore. Finally, sir, in the two minutes that I have, there's this goal of a five trillion dollar economy. Good, very good. I'll give you better goals. In 1990 91, India's economy was $325 billion. It doubled by 2003 4. Then the UPA government came. From $618 billion, it doubled to $1.22 trillion 
in four years. It doubled again to $2.48 billion in September 2017. It will double. It will double to $5 trillion. It doesn't require a prime minister or a finance minister. It will double. Why? That is the magic of compounding. Any money lender knows this. <laughs> Any money lender knows this. Any borrower knows this. If the economy, nominal growth of economy is 12%, it will double in six years. If the nominal growth of the economy is 11%, it will double in seven years. So I'm giving the finance minister a higher goal. You're going around the country saying we're going to build a $5 trillion economy by either 2023, 24 or 2024, 25. Very wisely. If it grows nominally at 12%, it will double in 2023, 24. If it grows nominally at 11%, it will double in 2024, 25. But I'm giving you another goal. Please say that either you or your successor, whoever it may be, will double it to $10 trillion by 2028, 20, 29. He will double it to $20 billion by, by 2032, 33. What is this great number of $5 trillion? It will always double every, every six years or seven years. Because nominal growth will be 11 or 12. So please don't put this pie in the sky before the people and say $5 trillion is equal to Chandrayaan landing on the moon. $5 trillion is simple arithmetic. It will double again and again. If you grow faster, it will double faster. If you grow so slower, it will take one more year. So don't put this pie in the sky. Come down to the reality. The economy is weak. The budget speech is insipid. A weak economy needed a bold approach. I think the Prime Minister has enough will and determination to take bold decisions. It's not necessary that everything has to be said in a budget speech. It can be done even after. It can be done during the course of this budget session. But I expect this government to come back and tell us what structural reforms they will do, what bold steps they will take, how they will improve investment, which is the only engine that seems to be available to them, to spur India's growth to 8% this year, and to raise it to double jit 10%. I'm afraid, sir, this budget does not inspire us to believe that that will happen. But since this government has a five-year mandate, I can only appeal to the government to pay serious attention to what we are saying. This is said in a spirit of genuine friendliness to get our economy going. Please ensure the bold structural reforms are done to boost economic growth. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you.